presentation is uh, being given to us by the Kansas Humanities Council, and it's being co-sponsored by our diversity class and a couple of other organizations on campus, including the library and the student engagement office. So I appreciate you uh, coming out today, and I want to introduce our, our speaker. Uh, Dr. John Birchall is a professor at Kansas Wesleyan University, which is in Salina. And um, he is an author and a criminal justice historian who teaches at Kansas Wesleyan, as I said. He's the author of this book, which he just gifted me, and I'm so thrilled. I can't wait to read it. Uh, it's called Bullets, Badges, and Bridles, Horse Thieves and the Societies that Pursued Them. He has master's degrees in criminal justice from Wichita State and rehabilitation counseling from Emporia State. And he joined the Speakers Bureau in 2014. So please welcome Dr. Virchel as he talks to us about uh, the Four Horsemen and a Sage. They told me I'm supposed to list my Kansas school. Sorry, Fort Hayes isn't, uh, uh, wasn't listed, but uh, I did uh, work in close by for a while in, in, in Russell. So really quick, before we get started, I need you to understand how this all works. With the Kansas Humanities, you pick a topic and you submit it, and good 18 months later, they tell you if it's approved or not, and, and then it after a period of time, it hits the road. So if you look at this and you say, he's given us some sort of political message about the election. I did this before the last election uh, occurred. So don't read anything in. I'm not trying to send any political messages uh, to you at all. This was all decided ahead of time. If, um, and if you want to know my political uh, beliefs, I'd be glad to visit with you afterwards, but I am a, a horrible moderate. I straddle the fence uh, a, a whole lot on a lot of issues, but I'd be glad to visit with you a little bit later. Should be interactive. I expect questions uh, going on. I have an outline to make sure that I just don't drift too far away from where I'm supposed to, but I encourage questions. And the purpose of this is we're going to be exploring um, four men that are called the Four Horsemen of Tolerance. And one of Kansas's greatest sages, William Allen White, and look at how they addressed fighting racism and, and promoting diversity in Kansas when it was a threat to their own reputation and personal safety. And from that, from our lessons in Kansas, we're looking for something that we could use today when these sort of activities occur again. Okay, so we're using the past to learn lessons that we could apply today and in the future. So we need to cover uh, some common terms that might come up really quick. Uh, prejudice, just like it sounds, prejudging. Okay? That's all we're talking about, and it's usually prejudging on an incorrect, at least how I'm going to use the term, an incorrect attitude, um, and it's usually based on someone's social group that they're attached to. Racism is the belief that one race is inferior, or if you want to flip the coin, superior to another. So that, that just means by racial characteristics, you believe someone's higher up, than someone else. Nativism. Nativism is, is uh, protecting the interests of native born or established inhabitants. Okay? Um, nativism. And then xenophobia, and yes, that's an X, but it's pronounced with the Z. Xenophobia is where you have fear, dislike, or prejudice against other people solely because they're different, they're foreign, um, and you don't know much about them. So we're going to go ahead and start with a uh, quote from John Meacham. This is a, a great book that I highly recommend to anybody, uh, The Soul of America, The Battle for Our Better Angels. And for those who might be interested, since we're in Lent, he just published a new book um, specifically looking at the leadership lessons to learn from Jesus while he was on the cross. Um, it, it's sort of an interesting uh, 
uh, a vent for him. But take a look at this. It seems that we see increased rate, all these hate crimes, everything tend to spike during periods of economic and social stress. What do we know about hate crimes in the United States in the last uh, two years? They've increased dramatically in the United States. Homeland Security has told us that clearly the biggest threat for terrorism is homegrown terrorists. That last year, the majority of all terror, 38 of the uh, uh, terrorist attacks and, and activities were done by Americans planning to attack other Americans. That's the greatest threat. So ask yourself, what sort of economic and social stress are we under now? Could there be a connection with what's happening economically and socially to what's going on today and what happened in the stories we're going to visit. So, let's take a timeline and start talking about Kansas originally. Uh, I want to talk about how the planets kind of lined up for this one. World War I, Bolshevik Revolution and birth of the KKK. Pretty close to the same sort of time. So, um, and, and they came together. So, uh, World War I. You all learned something about this in history class somewhere. Right? You remember, oh, somebody got assassinated in Europe, and that somehow led to a war. Okay? Uh, first of all, it was the Archduke Ferdinand, and keep in mind that almost all the rulers in Europe were all related to actually Queen Victoria. I mean, so there's a whole lot of, uh, of family stuff, and a lot of treaties were still being held together by family ties. So the Archduke is uh, assassinated in June of 1914. In August of 1914, in Europe, war breaks out. So it just took a month. In May of 15, you might have remember this one, Lusitania sunk. Okay, we had American citizens there. And November, that same, uh, so November 16, Woodrow Wilson is reelected as President of the United States based on the campaign that he kept us out of war. They re-elected him because Wilson kept us out of that European war where all those people are fighting way over there on stuff that we don't even pretend to understand. That's November. In April, okay, April, the United States declares war. And we've now entered into the war. And this is a scary war for the United States. You need to understand that when they got their draft notices, soldiers at that time, or civilians, were being drafted. If you got drafted into the army, you were drafted into the cavalry. You went to training with horses. They assumed that they were going to be fighting this war like they fought the last one on horseback. They weren't used to mechanical warfare. We saw by uh, the first major use of artillery with concussive, what we now know as traumatic brain injuries, um, trench warfare, gas attacks, technology had hit war. And people didn't know what to think about the stories they're hearing about, about this modern warfare and chemical attacks and and, and all sorts of other stuff. More people were dying, they heard about, from disease than even in war, and, and this whole, just totally different. Really shook a lot of people up. Uh, then we have the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, led by Lenin. Um, the Bolsheviks later became the Communist Party, uh, for, for those that are trying to keep track of that. Um, what's going on with the Bolshevik Revolution? What were some of the uh, precursors to that? And again, uh, just look for patterns. The people were upset in Russia that 1% of the population controlled 90% of the wealth. It wasn't fair. The people felt that overall that, that they, the people were getting screwed over. All right? And, and this wasn't a help at all. Uh, and, then they, and then we had a bad economy hit, and what happened? Everybody except the one percenters suffered. 
And that helped Lenin lead up to, and, and yes, there's other things in there. I'm helping reduce it for uh, time's sake. But really, the economy was a big one in the separation of the economy. Um, I, I wish I could tell you, I'm used to jokes. There's not a whole lot of jokes about war. You know, um, trying to, because uh, you're all looking so serious. I'm, maybe that's just the, the haze stare or something. Um, I think that's the 8.30 in the morning. Is that it? The economy was so bad at this time in Russia, even the czar was Nicholas. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's, it's going to be that kind of day. Um, all right, so then the birth of the KKK. Okay, what's going on with the Klan? Well, really interesting, why am I tying this up? The Klan was birthed earlier, not much happened with it. It was bad, but it didn't grow nationally until about this time. What was going on at this time? In 1915, a movie came out. A movie came out, A Birth of a Nation. It's a silent movie. I'm betting that you could access it on the internet or maybe even be a copy here in the library. This movie came out 52 years after Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. And what did this do? It glorified the Klan. <coughs> It, it, it's when you watch it, you look at it, and you don't have to study racism to know that it drips racism throughout this whole movie. <coughs> the North won the Civil War. The Union won the Civil War. The Confederacy won the war on rewriting history. Because they started changing history right after it happened. I mean, they started public. Uh, so we know from generals that they said, uh, Confederate generals, this is about slavery before and during the war. And the minute they lost the war, all of a sudden, those same generals are writing different papers saying it was all about states' rights. And, and they started coming out with some different language. They started attacking some of the Union people. Um, uh, 1866. Uh, in Pulaski, Tennessee, six former Confederate soldiers formed the Klan. One year later, they had a meeting in um, Nashville, at which time Nathan uh, Bedford Forrest uh, agreed a, a general to join and was elected as the Grand Wizard of the Invisible Empire of the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, but Birth of a Nation uh, grew uh, so much, much interest in this. We saw this kind of stuff happening in Washington, D.C. In the mid-20s, this was the largest fraternal organization in the United States. Okay? They, they were after the Klan, for those that don't understand, they were, um, they were against, yes, African Americans, but they were also against any immigrants, Roman Catholics, Jewish people. They were against a whole bunch of people. Okay, and uh, keep in mind by this time, uh, 1926, 75 congressmen were known to be open members of the Ku Klux Klan. And they would hold uh, marches proudly uh, down Pennsylvania Avenue. Okay, so again, we got social unrest, economic unrest, and we're entering a war with mechanized stuff, and this movie comes out. And people are worried, and all of a sudden people start joining this organization that promotes nativism. And their definition, uh, nativism, is white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, not necessarily the First Nations or P uh, Native Americans that were here first. It's them, people that looked like them. So anxiety of as a nation Help, help them to uh, grow. What, what does this do for Kansas? Well, take a look at an address in Kansas City. And yes, Kansas City, Kansas, not Mole. This is right after World War I, and they're now recruiting out in, uh, further west, and they're looking at Kansas as being prime, uh, a prime state to move into, 
and become the power, political and uh, behind the scenes power for Kansas. Now it's going to be a little difficult for you to see, but these are kids uh, proudly in their Klan outfit for a parade. Um, here you got the state par uh, parade. You got some images. This is what's going on in Kansas. They want Kansas. They want to take over Kansas. They, they're looking at some organizations to take over. They see this as a power grab for political and other types of power. The state of Kansas had just had a court decision, though, that said that for most organizations to operate as a nonprofit and to op and get things for like parade permits and stuff, you have to have a charter with the state of Kansas. So who wants to get a charter? Come on, the Klan, right? But they asked this during an election year, and so what happens is that there's a lot of debate going on in the legislators on what should we do? Should we allow it or not? Thus enters William Allen White. And for you guys to understand this, this guy in small town newspaper in Poria, Kansas, his editorials were getting reprinted not just across the nation, but across the world. They loved his, what they would call his folksy style of writing and calling things out as he saw them. Now, if you want to look at this man, his history, it's rather complicated. He's by no means perfect. But in his own writings, he keeps talking about how he's grown and changed. His viewpoints on, on religion, race, everything has, uh, has changed as he grew up and, and is looking at Kansas and saying that Kansas has a history of moderates. Um, throughout the history of Kansas, if you wanted to look at the two-party system, traditionally, and up to his time, a Republican in Kansas would be considered nationally fairly liberal, and a Democrat would be considered in Kansas nationally fairly conservative. I mean, we were sort of moderate people historically. Okay? And he embraced that concept, and it bothered him to no end that the Klan was coming in because he saw, he saw something changing, okay? And by the way, technology was newspapers, all right? So think about him as being Kansas's early day influencer uh, with a couple Pulitzer Prizes behind his uh, back already. Um, so former governor, Governor uh, Henry uh, Allen, was a reformer, he's concerned about the Klan, and he also knows that the Klan has taken over local elections in Emporia, the home of William Allen White, who started reporting on him. And he started calling the Klan out, and he started calling what he saw, and, and again, I mean, you know, he started calling BS. This is what they really are, this is who they really are, made no bones about it, okay? and. The governor then came to him, and this is a letter um, that he wrote back because the governor said, White, we need you to step up. Quit, quit teaching. It's time to quit teaching. It's time to start doing. All right? So look at this. This is a letter uh, uh, he wrote to this man. And if you look at... Did Birchall misspell? No, I actually put exactly how he wrote it, so. All right, here's what's going on. He runs as an independent, a last minute entry into the gubernatorial race, and runs as an anti clan uh, person. We got to stop the ability for them to get a charter. What happens? His life's threatened. One of his rallies, some firebombs uh, were let loose. Uh, you know, his, it hurt his business, um, certainly, but he got picked up nationally. 
and people were just amazed at, at what he was doing and talking about the Klan in a way that the world and, and the United States needed to hear. Um, so why are some of the concerns? This is, and yes, I'm tying this into some horse thieving. Uh, Kansas had, was part of a national organization called the Anti-Horse Thief Association, and uh, they went, like it sounds, from the early days, went after horse thieves. They had the power of arrest in Kansas. The Klan started to infiltrate this organization, too because if they could take over this organization, they would also have the power of arrest. They would become like an independent policing agency and use that power of arrest for their own objectives. It came under the attention of this man, another Kansas reporter, who was a, um, a, just a, a, another one of those great reporters. He was very, very... Um, uh, into uh, Native American rights. He was a staunch Catholic, and he understood what the Klan stood for and said the Klan cannot take over this organization. And so he starts promoting William Allen White. And uh, so what does White do? He goes after them with a vengeance, and I'm watching my time here. Uh, he goes after them, and... At the end of the election, honestly, what happens is uh, he loses. Three months campaign, he loses as an independent. But everybody else that announced themselves and the, as an anti-Klan person that he was also endorsing won their election. Uh, so quickly, Cottonwood Falls, he was in there, 1,500 people present. You know, they would set a cross on fire and break it up. Um, and here's uh, from The Nation, out east, the, the, the uh, magazine The Nation. Wrote to William Allen White, For a generation you have identified with all that's best and finest in the American tradition, but nothing in your long career is as important, essential, and as far-reaching re as your splendid stance. And that's what happened. He stopped the charter. Enough anti-Klan people got there um, now. But he had to go back to Emporia with a newspaper in Kansas that had a diminished circulation. His standing among a lot of Kansans was down. His standing nationally went up. Okay? But he risked his life his business, and his reputation to take a stand against evil in his community and in the state of Kansas. All right? But while he did that, a new storm's brewing. Okay? A new storm is, is brewing. And what's brewing is over Europe. We're used to funnel clouds in Kansas. Right? Uh, I, I try to tell, like, I, I don't know how, any, any Cali people here? California, a couple Cali. If we, uh, if we have a bad earthquake, I always look for California people because I have no idea what to do with a bad earthquake. Um, my, my experience is people from California freak out when the tornado sirens go off and Kansans go out and look for the funnel cloud. You know, that, and that's our mind is what a tornado watch is. You go out and watch the tornado. Uh, you know, yeah, um, yeah it, it's a little bit... Uh, uh, a little bit different, but this funnel cloud that's forming is over Europe again. And what's happening in Europe, you all know the story about a World War I veteran in Germany who enters politics. Well, it reaches into Kansas, that evil. This time, it's not in a white robe. This time, it's cloaked in the vestments of a religion and enters a new uh, player and purveyor of evil, this man right here, uh, Winrod, who publishes a magazine called The Defenders. He called, considers himself the defenders of Christian faith. He says he knows he's a prophet from God. He understands all about the book of Revelation. And by the way, in his publications, he said, there's a new politician in Europe 
by the name of Hitler, and he has all the right answers. We need to start embracing his philosophy. We need to get rid of the inferior people in our state and in our nation, that it's hurting our country. And we need to go back to Christian ideals as he defined Christian ideals. Because in 1928, a man ran for president called Al Smith, and people, he said he didn't win because he was Catholic. And we have so many problems now, our depression is caused by whom? Jews and Catholics. We need to get, we need to start embracing the stuff of this, you know, the, the, the teachings, the spewings of this guy, Hitler. Well, I mean, I just, this is from his headquarters in Wichita. Um, Expert in biblical prophecy, fundamentalist to the nth degree, had two different radio shows, 100,000 people uh, were subscribing to his literature, Kansas and, and across the nation. Um, and he decides he's going to run in 1938 for Senate to represent the state of Kansas. Because he knows the people of Kansas agree with him. All right? What's happening? In this country, we have a depression. We're coming, you know, a depression, and we're seeing bad stuff happening in Europe before, again. You know, we've been there before. We're getting worried. So a lot of people are, are flocking to his side. Enter the Four Horsemen of Tolerance. Now, why did they get the name Four Horsemen of Tolerance? They're from Wichita. The four founding fathers of, of Wichita were known as the Four Horsemen. Okay? But these all were from uh, Wichita and their clergy. So you have Rabbi Richmond. So, so uh, and I know this is not the beginning of a joke. Okay? But we have a rabbi, we have a priest, uh, or actually an, an Episcopal priest as well, Catholic priest, Episcopal priest, and a reverend from a congregational church. They were already involved in Wichita and helping refugees from Germany. And when they saw that Winrod filed for U.S. Senate or to represent the state of Kansas, they said, we cannot let a hate monger go to D.C. and people think that's what Kansas is about. So they all left their churches. They quit their jobs and they loaded up a truck and they traveled to every county in Kansas explaining exactly why you should not elect a hate monger to represent the people of Kansas. That you don't fight darkness with darkness, you fight it with light. And they went out there at, again, without their jobs. They left their jobs um, and they went out to, to fight this. Now, um, they centered quickly as a leader against uh, or, or with Rabbi uh, Richmond. Uh, you should know that really quick. As just a side note, he served as a chaplain in the army in World War One. He served as a chaplain in World War One at the front lines. Okay, and, and so he's already put his his beliefs in action, literal action at the front lines. Look what he's saying though. You don't evaluate religion and beliefs by uh, just what you say or in, in your piety. you got to do something. There's a time to teach. There's a time to act. They were engaged in issues of mercy, right? Helping German refugees. You all make sense? You're with me so far? So I'm, again, saving time. Think about this. You see bodies floating down the river. Going in and pulling the bodies out and, and rendering first aid to those that are still alive and caring for the dead, that's act of mercy. Justice, however, says you need to go upstream and find out and stop, find out why and stop the bodies going into the river. Okay? They said we have to stop our actions of mercy 
We have to start going after justice in the state of Kansas. They left their jobs. Now, what's really quick, uh, 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 interesting uh, ending, World War II breaks out, and, and Rabbi uh, Richmond joins up again. He's the only chaplain that served in World War I and World War II. And again, was not afraid of combat duty and left the army as a major. Okay, so I mean, the, uh, so these are what, what we have for people. Now, again, um, this carried risk. This carried risk. The, the, they had a ratty truck. They tied a speaker to it. You got, I, I tried to find a picture of it. I just couldn't find one, but I found a lot of descriptions of it. And they said that it was literally, the speaker, loudspeaker, was literally attached with bailing wire. As they drove around um, and attacking his uh, Winrod's beliefs. Uh, Winrod was one of the people that uh, uh, embraced a novel called The Protocols of Zion, which was written in France. Okay, it was a novel. Think about the Da Vinci Code. Right? You all familiar with the Da Vinci Code? Dan Brown says at the beginning of the Da Vinci Code, this organization's real here. But all the rest of the stuff in the book I'm making up. People read the book and what did they do? They started believing everything in the book. You know, and, he's, and, and Brown said, and in interviews, no, I made that stuff up. Yes, there's an organization, but that's why I said at the beginning, everything that they were doing in my novel isn't real. I made everything else up. But people still believe that. Protocol of Zion is the same thing. It was a French novel. It was the Da Vinci Code of its time. So it got such a big seller that it got translated to English. And basically it was about a big conspiracy, kind of like the Da Vinci Code, except at the center of it was um, Jewish people. And then from this, people started embracing anti-Semitism. That the Jews are secretly controlling banks, they're secretly controlling the media. It was a novel. Winrod points to this and says, here's proof of what the Jews are doing from a novel, from fiction, okay? Um, how, did, how do you tell the difference between real news and fake news is what they're trying to say. They're trying to go around and convince people the protocols of Zion is not news, it's a novel, okay? Uh, what some of the other things Winrod said uh, oh, he was also into this Illuminati, really controls the Masons, who really also control anything that the Jewish people don't control. Um, oh, uh, this is my favorite one. Uh, Winrod also said 75%, because he's a biblical scholar, 75% of all Catholic rites are really pagan. News to me, uh, and, and to a whole lot of Catholics and other uh, scholars. Um, so they went over, uh, and, and by the way, were attacks given to these men? Yes. What happened? Some, a, a family bought the Wichita Eagle, so they bought it so they could support the Four Horsemen of Tolerance. To try to deal with an influx of, try, of one man's attempt to influence an election with fake news. And they tried to go out and speak the truth. And they did. But the problem is, they came when they came back, not all of them were quickly welcomed back to their churches. But their goal was achieved. So what do we do today? What do we do today? So three years ago, Bethany College, our rival, I, I, I teach at Kansas Westland, so you've got to have a rival. As a matter of fact, as a faculty member, I'm the keeper of all the Bethany jokes. You know, so yeah, if somebody wants good fodder for a Bethany, they come to me. Um, Bethany got a new president. And the president had some biracial children that he had adopted. 
in moves into uh, Winsborg, Kansas, um, a hate group, a national hate group, and all of a sudden the campus at Bethany's tagged with Make Linsborg White Again, outlines of children on, on sidewalks with rest in peace, and then the president started getting death threats to himself and his children. He called up, uh, uh, they called me up to say, are you familiar with this hate group? I mean, and I actually told them yes. I explained who the hate group was, where they were located, how to report it. But what do we do when something like that happens? Rivalry is great in a college setting because it challenges us athletically, academically. I mean, it brings us together. But there's sometimes you set aside all that. And all the colleges that would play Bethany, and you know, they all surrounded Bethany, and to make sure that this hate group, Europa at the time, they've renamed themselves, rebranded themselves, but Europa at the time uh, realized that if they're going to go after Bethany College, they're going to have to go after a whole bunch of people and other institutions. Okay, there's a time to quit teaching and a time to start doing. It's increasing. If you, and again, as we enter this election, for some of you it might be just a slight cognitive leap, but I want you to go back four years. Okay, go back four years, and we arrested four people in Kansas terrorists who were going to blow up the day after the November election. They were going to blow up an apartment building in Garden City that had a, 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 a heavy population of Muslims, and they were going to open fire in a mosque. Their assumption was that uh, uh, Clinton was going to get elected, and they wanted to start a civil war. And the FBI moved in and arrested them because they realized one of their members actually had served in the military. By the way, if the FBI, if you try to buy uh, plastic explosives on the internet, the FBI is watching, and usually what you get shipped to is Play-Doh. You know, most people don't know the difference, but they realized they had a military person involved with this, so they had to use the real thing, and as soon as they took possession, they then arrested them, not letting them get away anywhere, do anything. So we had an earlier arrest with that. We had people trying to kill Kansans. We have people in the state uh, that, that were living in the state that wanted to put a college out of business because of who they, uh, who the president decided to adopt. We have a school district in Kansas that that three years ago forced out a high school teacher when they found out that he was gay. Hate's still out there. What do we do about it today? What do we learn about some of this stuff from, from just this historical people? Where should we go today? I'm asking you. This is the part where you're supposed to give me some sort of insight. This is, I'm not looking for the answer. I'm, I don't have one in my mind. I'm looking for one that we could use. Anyone? Come on. We need more brave people. A little louder? We need more brave people. All right, more brave people. I'm serious. We need, but we have some in Kansas. I mean, again, take a look at some of the stuff happening in Kansas. For those that don't, I mean, look at what's happening in our world. Right now, today, there are more people in slavery than were ever bought and sold in the transatlantic slave trade. There is still, including in Kansas, an underground railroad of people, primarily through the Catholic Church, that are trying to help, and the Episcopal Church, keep people that are being trafficked. And I'm talking about chattel slavery, bought and sold as property. So we have abolitionists working today in Kansas. We have an underground railroad that's working in, in Kansas. 
which by the way is a little bit difficult because a lot of these people are brought into this nation against their will, but also illegally. And what happens if you report it? Come on. They get, they get deported. So we take a crime victim and send them back, and if they're not in the country, are we going to get a conviction? No, there's no one there to testify, but they're getting victimized again. So we have abolitionists in the Underground Railroad. That takes risk. People are risking their careers. I just slavery. What about this other hate stuff? Where do you see other avenues? Hey, come on, have you guys, ex you all know about microaggressions? Right? Everybody familiar with the term? Yes, no, maybe, kind of. I got a couple kind of. It's difficult. I was at a meeting. Thank goodness it wasn't a, a, a campus meeting. I mean, you know, a Wesleyan one, where I heard the speaker start talking about the people he's been working with. Goes on and on. And then he says, I also worked with this uh, African-American woman, and she was very beautiful. I didn't hear anything else he said after that. Honestly, I mean, I immediately raised my hand and stood up and he, you know, what is it? And I said, I want you to know what I'm hearing when you said that. You didn't talk about the beauty of any of the men or anybody else you talked about. So what I'm hearing when you said that is that when you said that you work with a woman who was African American and beautiful was that they normally are not. That's what I heard. Right? I mean, that's what I heard. And, and let me tell you, it's not easy to stand up and say that in a public uh, a place. And I'm waiting for the response. I'm hoping most microaggressions somebody does unintentionally. And the response usually is, oh, I'm so sorry. That wasn't my intent. That's not how I wanted the message to go. I'm so, you know, thank you for pointing it out. I, you know, I'll, I'll try. That's what you expect with a microaggression. This person just kind of stared at me and blinked for a few minutes and then continued to talk. So what do you think? Come on. He knew what you were really saying. Here's the deal when we talk about all these issues. You got to start fine-tuning your radar to, to, to discover these. It's, it's kind of like cancer. Look at what we've seen with these. The, uh, the, the philosophy of a cancer cell is growth for growth's sake. Uncontrolled growth, okay? Uh, and we see that with a lot of help, uh, 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 hate groups. But the, every doctor will tell you the best time to go after cancer is when it's in a precancerous stage, before it takes, takes root. But you've got to call on it. You've got to do something on it early. You have to stand up and say something. And that's what these Kansans did. Okay? That's what these Kansans did. So we, and it's difficult. So look at me. I reek every privilege that's out there. I'm white, male, Christian, heterosexual. You know, I, I started seeing um, sexism because of my wife. You know, and, and she kept pointing it out, and then, you know, kind of give me the old dope slap, you know, bam, didn't you see that over there? I, yeah, I have to fine-tune my radar. Why should I be paying close attention to that? Because I'm getting the reward. I'm sitting back in comfort because of my privilege. But you all know the poem, right? First it came for the Jews, but I'm not Jewish, so I did nothing, right? Go all the way down, trade unionists. Then they came for me, and there was no one else left to help fight. we got to go after this early, take care of the precancerous cells. And we have examples of Kansans who have done that. So what do you need to do for, for diversity? I mean, think about it. As a Christian, nobody is... Thomas Jefferson, former president, right? And when you take the oath of office, put your hand on what? The Bible. The Bible, right? And that Bible Jefferson put his hand on? Anyone? Koran. 
Je Jefferson realized th that, that there was religious intolerance building up. Washington, while he was president, wrote a letter to a Jewish temple when he saw anti-Semitism, asking how that they, they supported the revolution, how can I help as president? Jefferson did something symbolic to, to fight religious intolerance. I can go around and say, I need Good Friday off. It's a religious holiday. Nobody's batting an eye. But if I use a term like Ramadan, they don't even know what that means. You know, isn't that kind of like a noodle? You know, it's, I, you don't, you, you get these, you have to learn. We have to watch. We have to fine tune our radar. We can't allow this stuff to continue. My guess is, because I know it's in Salina, I was aghast to find that some property in Kansas still has written in the original deed covenants where you can only sell this, the property to white people. Now, you can't enforce that anymore. It's illegal. But it's still in the original deeds. How would you feel when you start looking at that and looking at your deed when you buy your first house? I mean, we still have that history there. How do we address that? How do we respond to those sort of things, and how do we stand up next to people? I mean, it, I mean, this stuff's happening, and it's happening to your fellow students and fellow Kansans, right? So what do we do? How do we go about it? Come on. Yeah. Just keep talking about it. <clears throat> keep talking about it? What did William Allen White do besides writing about it? Ran for office. Ran for office. I joined, I'm a commissioner with the Human Relations. I investigate now in the city of Salina uh, accusations of racism and discrimination. I mean, I had to fill out an application and, and, and ask to do that. I mean, there's opportunities to, so we'd run for office or find some sort of passion that you're about, a volunteer agency that helps with the victims of human trafficking, uh, something, to, but stand up and do something because uh, I'm telling you that when we talk about servant leadership, the biggest danger is not some jerk of a boss, but it's other servant leaders who refuse to stand up and lead. William Allen White did so by running for office. So, so what else can we do? And, and talk about, yeah. Start really accessible organizations. Okay, and how, what would that look like? I mean, I, help me um, out. Like on campus, there's like the Black Student Union and like Arts for Social Change and things like that. Okay, yeah. Um, and, 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 and involve as many people as you want. Think about it. Arts for Social Change. I mean, there's a lot of people that may not be, feel comfortable talking, but they're creative in other ways. I mean, yeah, that's brilliant. What's some other ways? Come on. I know it's an early class, but yeah. It's been proven that having GSAs in high schools has like heightened tolerance towards like LGBT communities and various other like minority groups. Okay. So like having those kind of groups in high school where like people are still being educated about like before adulthood. Sure. What other social changes are going on in our country right now? Come on. Economic class. Economic class. Come on. What's what's the big news? Not Super Tuesday. After Super Tuesday, what's the big news? And I'm not talking about entertainment tonight. I'm talking about real. What? Coronavirus. Coronavirus. Have you guys heard any conspiracies about that? And what some of the reactions we want to do? Who started it? We need to start banning people. We're not going to start profiling people. Um, oh, I bet you came from China. You know, it's, uh, what do, I mean, so that I mean, we got that changed. What else has changed? And here's a tough one because <coughs> you grew up in it, and I admit that I'm a crypt keeper sort of age here. But social media which I thought was brilliant when it came out because you have the potential, I'm thinking people have the potential to be more connected with people that are different than themselves than ever than before. And what happens? 
all the people in your group are just like you. They're same activity, same sport, same whatever. You become more and more isolated. After an event, people don't hang out anymore. Right? What are we seeing as a result? We are seeing increases uh, of people with trauma that don't know how to deal with trauma. They're more isolated. There's something called ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experience. If you're thinking about education as a career, you're going to learn about ACEs. But we now have whole school districts, even in Kansas, that are trauma-informed because the majority of their students are testing out so high in the ACEs thing. Why? Because they're, they're not doing the same stuff that we used to do that helped address trauma. Well, we do, we escape from it. We plug in uh, Fortnite or whatever the latest game is. I have no idea. I lost after Pong. But um, the, the, yeah, they're plugging into whatever the latest games are and, and escaping, not addressing and dealing with it. Come on, some others. I want you to walk away with something you could use. These are all great ideas. Our country's getting, like, super polarized. It's getting super polarized. Yeah, and you, and you can't have... And you can't have civil discussions anymore. Why not? Why do you think that's happening? I agree with you. I mean, 100%. Well, I mean, how do we deal with that? Yeah. People, I feel like people are afraid of losing rather than like actually talking about what's going on. So losing what? Their argument or? Mm, I guess. I'm trying to, so how, what would, how would we go about fixing that? Come on, somebody, yeah. Have those hard conversations with people, you know, like don't just like let things go, like talk about them. Okay, and, and, and also maybe who's talking too, but yeah. Um, some campuses are starting things like interfaith dialogues, um, you know, interrace dialogue. I mean, they're having, they even have scholars so they can start learning how to discuss stuff. Who you discuss? Look, I'm a gun owner, right? Uh, just real quick, I teach criminal justice, no surprise. Um, I'm a gun owner, but guess what? I'm not an NRA member. I, you know, the fact that there's more, there is more uh, regulations. Uh, on the pillow on my bed that manufactures that pillow than on a handgun. And there's some crappy handguns being imported where if it drops off a table, it could go off. You know? Um, so can, can't we have a discussion about uh, uh, handguns and still say the Second Amendment exists? And most people would say no. You guys have a class to go to, or most of you have a class to go to, I realize that. So I, so I was trying to hurry up through this. Any other last minute questions? Last chance. I'll hang around for any other questions then. Get out of here.